egg for Martinique. That's what I'm going to do. I have actually paid Peterson May, the ship transport company who are going to put the boat on the deck of a big cargo ship. I've actually paid them the money. I've just come back from, I don't know, about six weeks um, cruise from here at Boulogne to um, to the Solent, to uh, across to Sherbourne, Alderney, then to uh, Torquay and Dartmouth, and then back to Alderney, back along the French. And frankly, it's changed. Um, and it is that change that has made me make, for me, this enormous commitment to move Golden Haze to Le Marin in Martinique for the trip, and I've booked it um, to depart Southampton somewhere during the month of November. Huge commitment, um, huge logistical exercise. Um, I mean, nothing compared with sailing down to the Canaries with uh, all the problems of Brexit and 90 days and all that, but nonetheless, a, a big logistical commitment for me. Um, I got back here into Boulogne about 10 days ago, two weeks ago, and went, damn it. I'm going to do it because it's just too crowded up here in the channel. It's not just the English ports, but it's also the French. It is just so crowded. I had two occasions when marinas virtually refused to let me in because they were, they were too full. These are the British ones. The French ones, I think, have a legal obligation to find you somewhere or to let you raft up or something, but um, it was just too much. And so, I am looking forward to sailing in open waters um, and dropping the hook in bays with, yeah, of course there'll be half a dozen other yachts there or three or four other yachts there, but that's what I'm looking forward to instead of crowding into marinas at enormous amounts of money every night. And a feeling that sailing somehow in the UK has financially taken over the lives of those of us with boats, um, that the whole thing has become such an expensive challenge, I just don't think it's worth it. So, my hope is that this trip uh, to Martinique is going to do it. I got the boat back in here, uh, signed up on the Peters and May document, transferred the US dollars to, uh, to their account, went down the boat, serviced all the winches, which seemed to be like a really good thing to do, and then I started to go through the boat, taking off everything which was there for cold weather sailing. Um, I'd got jumpers and jackets and gilets and um, woolly socks and... Anyway, three bag loads of uh, warm weather stuff came off the boat, um, and she is now stripped down to the two cabins. I've got one duvet and I've put some sheets on board and I'm gradually um, going through my wardrobe collecting my hot weather sailing stuff um, which I'm going to put in, all of which I'm going to put in Golden Hay so it gets transported so that when I fly out there uh, I don't um, everything will be there. All my clothing will be there, everything I need so I can fly out with basically just my laptop and that's it really exciting. Got into the insurance thing and that which I thought I'd cracked and uh, was really easy um, I am now working on hard. Um, I've had one solution from a British company based in Spain for 300 quid a year um, who are going to insure me with a company in Bogota or is it no Samoa a company in Samoa are the uh, actual under uh, the actual uh, insurance company, and my feeling about that is, my chance of getting paid out on that is pretty well zero. Um, what it does do is it gives me a ticket to get into any Caribbean marina I want to, because they all insist on you having at least third-party insurance um, and Le Marin. So I could I could buy that. I have now found another Caribbean insurance company, um, the one in Martinique, April Marine, total disaster. They um, they promised uh, they promised the earth, and they ended up offering me a third party insurance with Pantaneous for a thousand quid a year. Thank you very much. 
Um, I've now got another one that is based in Barbados and Florida, and I'll give you the name a bit later in the diary when it uh, when I've actually fulfilled it. Um, and they are offering me um, three, six, five days in the water. Um, the deductible, of course, of 10% for, for named uh, things, uh, fully comprehensive, single-handed sailing, everywhere except the American Virgin Islands um, uh, and Venezuela and Cuba and Haiti. Um, and I guess that includes the Dominican Republic. Um, anywhere except those places, well, you know, that's fair enough. I've, I don't think I would want to go to any of those in the present, in their present political climates. So, the insurance thing is coming along. My next, uh, my next big thing is that at the end of September, the plan is to uh, jump into Golden Hay, sail across to Eastbourne, whiz along the south coast via Brighton and the Lude Channel, and get her to Cowes, where the yacht haven there in Cowes are doing me an excellent deal monthly deal absolutely brilliant because I need to have her placed somewhere near Southampton docks or possibly Portsmouth docks um, so that I can just whiz her there in a few hours uh, in order to load or what I would in fact do is I in fact go into one of the very very expensive marinas in those areas for a couple of days and then uh, then take her around to the loading. Um, I could mainland UK, uh, I couldn't find anything that was remotely financially possible to uh, keep the boat in. But now, provided I get away in September, um, I should, I should, be, during the end of September, beginning of November, I should find weather windows enough to get me to cows. Um, that's the plan, anyway. And that's the first logistical, that's the first logistical issue. Um, get her to cows. I will then come back here to Boulogne, um, sort out a uh, permanent garage for my car, uh, sort out shutting the house down for three to six months and getting myself ready for this really, really exciting project. The ship will actually discharge Golden Haze in Antigua, um, which is fine. That's 150 miles north, um, about three days, three days gentle sailing, uh, anchoring overnight uh, behind islands uh, to, uh, to Martinique. They will actually deliver Golden Haze to Antigua 14, 16 days after I've loaded her. So I will then um, come back here, get all my things ready, and then get myself ready to fly to uh, fly to Antigua from Gatwick, having got a train from Boulogne to Lille to St Pancras to Gatwick, which I should be able to do and have a night in a hotel. So anyway, I, I, as you can tell, I am really, really excited. A bit div devastated by the cost of it all. It is, everything is costing more than I anticipated. Not hugely, but just more, and I guess that's always the way with boats. But hell, you know, you only live once, do you? Uh, life's short, it's not a rehearsal, and I hope the Caribbean is just going to open up a whole new little, uh, slightly older lifetime sailing experience for me. It's 10 miles round the rock-strewn coast of Antigua from St John's, where Golden Haze will be splashed, into Jolly Harbour, where I need to buy a courtesy flag and pay for my cruising permit and so on. And importantly, I've purchased a long plastic-covered stainless steel cable with swage dies at each end and two big strong padlocks. One thing is certain, that if you don't chain up your dinghy, outboard and spare fuel can, they'll be stolen, even alongside your boat during the night. I also purchased a four-man life raft, which I felt I didn't need in Channel Waters, but as almost none of the islands have any search and rescue, I felt it was a quite good investment. If you get into trouble out there, nothing is going to happen very quickly, and you're dependent on passing vessels 
and commercial services which you're going to have to pay for eventually. This is a good reason for having um, at least third-party insurance to cover the costs of search and rescue, you know, aircraft tugs and so on. As VH Radio, with its 50-mile range, is dependent on having the mast up, I also got an EPIRB as a sort of last resort backup. The system's got a high percentage of false alarms, something like 90%, and a lot of checking is done before the system requires assistance on your behalf. But, of course, it has a vastly longer range than, say, my handheld VHF, which uh, probably has a range of maybe 10 miles. I'm very aware that everything connected with the boat in the Caribbean is very expensive, simply because it has to be imported from the United States or Europe, and duty has to be paid on its arrival. I need to have a good internet connection for doing stuff like this, and there are data SIM cards available from Orange Carib and others. So, I've installed a T-Link data router that runs off 12 volts and will connect to my mobile phone, tablet, laptop, and so on. It's a 4G LTE from T-Link, and it cost me 70 quid. Actually, with the awful Wi-Fi in many French and English marinas, it's something I think I would have installed anyway. I already have the Navionics for the entire Caribbean installed in my plotter, and I've got charts and books from the last time I was there, but that was some 20 years ago. Well, it's enough to find the anchorages I need uh, behind the islands en route from Antigua to Martinique. Uh, all my stuff is, of course, very out of date these days. Uh, but in those days, I didn't have a plotter or navily, which actually is a very useful app for finding anchorages and marinas. And to support all these electronics, I'm installing a couple of solar panels on the Bimini. Two, uh, two by 60 watts. Whilst cruising here in the summer, I found I was having to run the motor to charge my batteries um, every few days when I was on anchor or hanging off a buoy. Hopefully, the Caribbean sun will fuel these two panels. The hardest part of this installation has been locating the studs to attach the panels to clip onto the bimini. Still, I'm sure I'll have solved that problem by the time I get there, I hope. I intend asking Roth Electronics in Cowes to do this installation for me when I get her there. And I have a load of rice and tin food, plus a load of anti-mosquito coils and spray, so I don't need to find shops when I get to Antigua. I'd like to set sail pretty instantly for Martinique. Boat insurance has been very difficult with a lot of paperwork involved. I wanted the boat itself insured, and then I wanted third-party public liability cover um, in case I crunch some expensive catamaran or, um, or even if I, I got rescued and had to pay for the services. And um, I wanted this cover to run for 12 months of the year in the water, 12 months of the year. All the insurance companies asked for an in-water survey, thus saving me hauling and launching and so on. Finding a surveyor was challenging. Rather silly response, if like it's unethical. The insurance company don't know what they're talking about. But finally, I found a surveyor in East Cows with international experience who'll do it for me when I get her to Yacht Haven. I've paid Peters and May the fee for shipping the boat to Antigua, the deal is that if they cannot get enough bookings to their port, they will offer me an alternative, which I can refuse and receive a 100% refund. The alternative would almost certainly be in the Virgin Islands, which are some 400 miles north and west of Martinique, and much of it to Wynwood, and that's a hard trip single-handed. They're very good, Peterson May, at updating me, and things are looking okay for Antigua, so I'm optimistic but I do have a plan B. I blocked out four days in my diary to move Golden Hayes to Cowes, and of course the weather just made a nonsense of that with gales blowing up in the channel, day after day after day. The moment they subsided, I climbed out of the bunk with a forecast of 20 knots and about 20 degrees off the bows, moderating noon to light and variable and a two or possibly three day window. So, at dawn, I got Golden Hayes off her moorings 
and out of the lock into the basin at Bassin Napoleon under a pretty dismal drizzle I set off for Eastport. I forgot to put the log in, which is a shame. Now making four knots, twenty knots of wind on the nose. One of the advantages of Boulogne is the big outer harbour, which gives shelter for recovering warps and fenders before heading out into the channel. Once clear of the breakwater, it became pretty lumpy as dawn came up and the wind was not 40 degrees off the bows and it was pointless to even try setting the main. Nonetheless, I was making four and a half knots over the ground helped by the ebb tide also pushing me west. As I entered the very busy shipping lanes, I was called by a slow-moving ship called Nachi Pavlov, who requested I keep well clear of the submarine it was escorting. He wanted me to go round his bows rather than between him and, the sub and his submarine, who at that stage I couldn't see. And there, through the mist and the rain, I could make out the shape of a submarine running on the surface at about 10 knots. Clearly not a happy sun. About five minutes later, I heard a voice coming on 16 calling, Russian submarine, Russian submarine, this is the French warship astern of you. I looked over my shoulder and there was a very, very big warship steaming up channel, clearly French. The British shipping lane was busy and challenging as well, but the good news was the weather forecast was accurate and around noon the winds eased, rain stopped and I was able to get some sail up and hasten my arrival to Eastbourne, which welcomed me with blue skies. And for once I was entering around high water and Sovereign Port Control prepared the lock for me and directed me to a berth. Having parked up, I cleared in with border force, had a meal, climbed into my bunk with my Eberspasche running. Next morning, I fueled up and headed out for Brighton, as the weather forecast predicted gales coming in that night and then for the next four days. Brighton Marina, Golden Hayes. Do you copy over? Station for your this is Golden Haze. Good afternoon. Uh, would you have a berth for me for four or five nights? I'm a 10 metre sailing boat. Golden I was allocated an inside berth in the middle of the marina, which suited me fine, knowing the strong westerlies were coming in. I parked up between two delightful liverboard boats, both of whom made me feel very welcome during my short stay. The pontoon was a bit short for Golden Haze, but with plenty of cleats so it worked out fine and she was easy to secure well for the incoming weather. My stepson and daughter live in Brighton, so I usefully spent time with them and with my sister who lives nearby. Frustrating to be stormbound for so long, but good to spend time with the family. Dawn of day five saw me heading out of Brighton. Okay, after sitting in Brighton for four days with gales, it's now really cold and I'm heading out towards the Lou Channel 
and cows on the uh, an ultimate leg of this uh, delivery to Southampton. My intention is to get to cows, park up in Cows Yacht Haven, who've done me a really good deal uh, at their winter rates, and then just before loading um, in Southampton, take the boat up to somewhere in Southampton Water for a couple of nights. So, uh, yeah, that's it. It's, uh, it's on the nose, of course. Uh, got about 15 knots on the nose. Uh, I'm motor sailing. I've got the uh, jib out and the main, main up. Uh, and I'm heading west. And it's cold. Really cold. I had the tide with me through the loo, producing almost seven knots over the ground. And around noon, the sun came out and the rest of the 47 mile passage was pleasant with blue skies and a bit of wind to sail by. It's now uh, 10 past five. I told them I'd been in between five and six. There's a channel. Golden Haze, Golden Haze. Cows, are you receiving, are they? Yeah, cows, copy that, go ahead. Uh, Golden Haze, can you uh, inform your length, sir, your total length, over? Uh, 10 metres, 10 metres, over. Uh, receive, stand by. Uh, Golden Haze, Golden Haze. Um, if you take the outside breakwater, outside breakwater towards the southern end, the southern end, please, sir, type as close as you can to the boat in front. Cheers. Made it to Cowes. I sat in Brighton for four days with weather going through. Um, even when it was pretty calm, it was still 20 knots on the nose, which, you know, the little engine is hopeless. Anyway, left the marina at uh, 07.30, was going out through the entrance at 8 o'clock, and I got in here to Cowes at uh, half past five. They've got three or four Cowes Yacht Haven Marina. I'm at. I'm on the outside berth, as you can, uh, you can see, um, just for tonight, uh, because they've got three rallies in, and the whole place is actually chock-a-block. I mean, it, it's amazing how many people sail in the winter in the Solent. I'm duly impressed. Mind you, it's a lovely day. Once I got through the Lou Channel, it was the sun was shining. It was really, really nice. I've, um, I'm just about to write my log book, which will uh, comprise of Left Brighton 7.30, Got into cows. 1700, 1715. And that's it, really. That's the end of this uh, first stage of uh, getting her to Antigua. Um, I'm going to move the berth tomorrow midday when all the rallies have gone. Uh, they're going to move me around to the inside residence area of uh, Yacht Haven, which would be lovely. Uh, I'll see Roth Electronics to get them to sort out my the connections to my solar panels. Uh, get the survey done by uh, Mark Harrison, I think it is, who lives just across on the other side of the river. And, uh, and that's it. The original shipping window was between the 1st and the 30th of November. And at that stage, with less understanding of the shipping industry than I have now, I imagine that date to be around mid-November. At the beginning of November, the loading window changed to the 15th to 30th of November and my excitement mounted. Then on the 8th of November I got my first personal loading email from Peters and May saying they had chosen the good ship Riderland to transport Golden Haze and others across the Atlantic. On the 15th of November I got this email telling me that the probable loading date was now the first was now December the 1st and on that basis I 
booked a ferry from Calais to Dover on the 27th to go to Golden Hayes in Cowes Yacht Haven and move her to a marina in Southampton. Prepare her for loading by taking off the sails, spray hood and bimini with its new solar panels. And the morning after my arrival in Cowes, I set sail. Well, started the motor and headed for Town Key Marina in the centre of the Southampton Docks area. Wasn't bad last night. Um, long trip down, felt really knackered by the time I'd, I don't know, got up in the morning, closed the apartment down, got in the car, driven to Calais, got on a P&O ferry, got off a P&O ferry, drove for two and a half hours to Southampton, put the car in the multi-storey car park, walked with all my bags and stuff down to uh, City Marina first just to check that my birth's okay for today, which it is, um, and then City Marina hung around for an hour while I got the red funnel. Um, being over 65 had no disadvantages, it was £12.50 instead of £18. So becoming a mature person has its advantages. Well, that might be the only advantage. Anyway, Town Key Marina, Golden Hayes. Do you copy over? This is Town Key Marina, go over. Yeah, good morning to you, or oh, good afternoon. Um, I'm just outside the entrance. May I come into the visitor's berth, please? Yeah, come on out the inboard side. Inboard side, you come round over. Okay, I may try and see if I can turn around so I'm ready to leave in a day or two. Town Key, copy. Roger that, thank you. Standing by to it. Town Cream Marina is small but beautifully formed. It's actually a very nice place to wait for loading uh, as it's in the middle of Southampton docks and it's also in the middle of the town with supermarkets, pubs and restaurants all close by. The next email, which arrived the day I got to Town Key, showed an extended loading period to now the 3rd of December and a warning about Christmas and stevedores on the other side of the Atlantic. I then removed the jenny, folded it up and got it in the sail bag and took the spray hood off and the bimini. The next day the loading jade changed again and that happened on a daily basis from then on. The dates getting later moving forward to the 6th of December giving me a loading time of 0800 at dawn and the news that I needed a hard hat, high vis jacket and boots, none of which I had. I called my crew and nephew Sim, asking him to get a couple of hats and jackets and informed him that he was probably going to have to drive down and sleep on board on the 5th, ready for the early start the next morning. The next email moved my loading date to the 8th, but a load time of 10.30, which meant that Sim could drive down in the morning. The next email changed the loading time to 13.30, which pleased both Sim and me very much indeed and felt a lot more civilised. Bravely facing the challenge of the mile and a half motoring across the docks to the good ship Riderland, we set off with an ETA of 13.15 for our 13.30 appointment, only to discover that the motorboat, which was meant to load before lunch, was still sitting alongside and the yacht that was meant to load after Golden Haze was also there, a good hour and a half early.
And so the waiting game started. The motorboat was moved further astern and the stops were lowered and eventually she was lifted up and swung inboard to be lowered into her waiting cradle. This process of loading the motorboat took well over an hour and a half, longer than the anticipated one hour. We were then signalled to come alongside where the rope ladder hung down the hull of the ship. To my horror, I saw it was of the broomstick type, really narrow round treads, and not at all the pilot type ladder that I'd envisaged. Peterson May had warned that the boat crew must be capable of climbing a 40 foot ladder from the yacht to the ship's deck. I thought I probably could, but not a rope ladder with only tiny tow holds. The ship dropped lines to us alongside. Then a professional in the form of Colin, the Peters and May loadmaster, showed how broomstick ladders should be used and joined us on deck. It appeared that the divers who normally guide the lifting stops into place and position them either side of the keel were not available that day, which explained why the lifting of the motorboat had taken so long. Normally the Peters and May loading team comprises of two people, which would speed things up enormously. But the second member of the team was off ill and there was no replacement possible. Standard normal keel with a bowl, is it? Uh, Michael? Is yeah. it a thin keel or tuned a bit bowl? Michael? Yes. What, what sort of keel do you have? Uh, I've got a thin keel. Oh. Um, another fender we can put on this. Michael? Yeah, another fender. Yeah, there, sir. Once the starboard aft lifting strop was positioned, a line was tied to it to prevent it moving forward. Colin then collected the port strop, tied it off at the bows, and then pulled the other aft back to the position on the stern. I collected the starboard forward strop and fixed the line to it so that it could be moved forward to the bows. Clearly, the positioning of the strops would have been easier if the divers had been in the water and if there had been at least one other Peters and May loadmasters or, or assistants. You're an ex-military, you only made it down with We're just going to come down the top, right? and I'm going to take a bit out of the high side. Chief, just a small hook down, please, Chief. Colin was the consummate professional. Okay, Chief, Clearly enormously experienced and very, very conscientious. Taking good care of the boat was paramount despite being understaffed. Don't be fooled by this edit. 
From Colin coming on board to the start of the lift had to be the best part of an hour, and I don't think anyone could have set up lifting stops faster or better. I always felt Golden Hayes was in very good hands. From here, we clambered onto the deck of the good ship Riderland, and the very, very delicate business of craning Golden Hayes up and guiding her between the obstructions and masts began. Lowering her into the cradle presented a keel-high problem, and the cradle had to be adjusted with the help of an angle grinder. Sim and I went back on board and replaced the backstays, closed down all the electrical systems, covered the wheel, and locked her up before climbing back down onto the ship's deck and getting a taxi to our cars to the multi-storey car park. Sim driving to London, and me to Ashford and the tunnel to Calais, then home. Five days before Christmas, I'm on an expensive jet plane flying transatlantic to meet Golden Hayes in Antigua. And only one day behind schedule, Sim and I are on the deck of Ridelander, dressed in our hard hats and high-vis jackets, ready to climb aboard and prepare Golden Hayes to be splashed into the Caribbean. Once aboard, again, we remove the backstays and uphaul and set out fenders on the starboard side. Peterson May had a full loadmaster team of two and Will came on board to secure the two lifting stops. Sim and I left the boat again and climbed down the ladder onto the deck of Ridelander, closely followed by Will. And with me and Sim safely on board again, she was lowered into the sea where I went below to purge the air out of the Volvo shaft seal. Sim and I carefully reset the backstays for hopefully the final time. The straps were removed. Sim reset the topping lift whilst I went below to start up all the electronics and get the engine running.
What is known in the trade technically as a good shot off was performed by Sim and on a blustery Caribbean morning, Golden Hayes departed the tender care of Peters and May and Rydlander. Right. Oh, thank God. And all the old gods too. Congratulations, Skipper. Well, unloading is a million times easier than loading. So, three days before Christmas, in a glorious 25 degrees, we made the two-hour rock-hopping trip round to our first port of call, Jolly Harbour. We went astern into our first Caribbean mooring in order to put on the sails, spray hood, bimini and solar panels and prepare ourselves for our 150 mile voyage south to Martinique where an annual berth was reserved for Golden Haze. had a fairly lumpy, windy 150 mile sail down from Antigua to uh, Guadeloupe to Dominica to Martinique and it was fun. I'm really lucky to have a, a berth facing into the trade winds so I can have the forward hatches open and I can sit really comfortably in the saloon writing or editing or doing stuff like this or contemplating the meaning of life with a gentle breeze that sort of wafts through the cabin. Um, it's great. Um, okay, it's 28 degrees most of the day, except around noon when it's a bit more. And most people retire into the shade at noon and sit down or lay down or have a relax. At night I'm sleeping in my cabin in uh, boxer shorts, but around 2 a.m. I pull the sheet over me just to keep out the cold. Hmm, I'm really lucky to be here. So what is it actually like having my boat here? Well, this marina, like most of the Caribbean, majors on the charter trade, mainly on huge 50 to 70 foot catamarans with a skipper and a hostess in which the charterers enjoy sailing, anchoring, sailboards. All the monohull boats out here are big. In fact, most of the privately owned boats in the marina are 43 foot upwards, so my little Benetou 323 is a minnow. Small, but beautifully formed, as Dudley put it. So, much of life happens from the cockpit. Bigger boats do it better. It is all a bit cheek by jowl compared to the UK, where we normally have fingers off the pontoon for your boat to moor alongside, and that sort of separates the boats out, the boats out a bit. The berths here are designed for stern to mooring with two lines on the back, round pontoon cleats, which you back up to and adjust for how far you want your stern and stern fenders to be from the pontoon, and one or two fixed lines going either to a buoy with a ring on the top of it, or down to presumably a very heavy chain or concrete blocks under the water. At the moment there are at least four other English boats here. The two came here directly from their first landfall after Atlantic crossings and others came from St Lucia where they arrived with the Ark. Coming off the pontoon there are convenience stores, pizzerias, a dozen or so cafes and restaurants, there's a baker for a fresh morning croissant or baguette, there's a medical centre with a GP, paramedics and a nurse with a physio next door. There's a big chandeliers and there's various yacht maintenance places. Literally just across the road is an Auchan supermarket 
not the biggest, but it has got fruit and veg, as well as a pretty wide range of goods, including wine and rum. Just along the path towards the old marina, which is also a major yacht charter base as well, are stainless steel suppliers, welders making everything from stern frames for solar panels and dinghy davits to pulpits and push pits, everything you need for the boat. Next door are riggers installing rolling roller reefing furling, they're re-rigging and a 70-foot um, catamaran as I speak. This company also has departments for aircon, fridges and boat electronics from solar panels to radar to chart plotters. It's all a bit like a permanent London boat show back in the day and there's a really nice restaurant selling local type meals run by two sisters. Another half hour's walk gets you to the Marina Bay area which houses the huge boatyard with its 500 ton with its 500 ton travel lift and a small 150 ton lift for boats like mine as well as storage and special systems to tie the boats down during the hurricane season. The cost of hauling my 10 meter boat in and out including three days on the hard all inclusive hauling in out three days on the hard is going to be 600 euros say 550 pounds this is the part of the bay where you can also buy sim cards for your router or your phone from Digi digicel who are the company which operate most throughout um, the caribbean islands Ian. english is spoken by all the commercials all the business owners and the euro is really the only currency in circulation so currency exchanges easy at an ATM machine which are simply everywhere and the cost of keeping Golden Hayes and her marina berth here well the contracts are six monthly and for my 10 meter boat it's 1800 euros half a year or 3600 a year which equates to somewhere around £3,000 a year. You can buy quite a lot of airfares with the savings on these marina prices. The cheapest airfare is from Paris and it's around €500, Euros, say £450. And from there to the UK there's a choice of EasyJet for around £30 or £40. Pounds. And basically the living is good. See ya. My library of digital sailing books is at gentlesailing.com so you can buy them as instant downloads. There's a link to a printer who can convert them to hard copy if that's what you prefer. I've just totally updated and republished French Canal Routes to the Mediterranean which is now in its 12th edition and is fully up to date with new information, charts and pictures. Recently I published Your Boat in the Sun which proved an instant popular success. It's about where to keep your boat in the Mediterranean or the Caribbean and the costs and the logistics involved. The Atlantic Crossing Guide has become a bestseller and it outsells most of the others, probably because it's arguably one of the most comprehensive guides to sailing to the Caribbean that's available. The Gentle Sailing Route to the Mediterranean is one of the most popular publications that I have. It describes how to coast hop all the way to Gibraltar without having to spend a night at sea. There are books about marinas in the Med, sailing in the Caribbean islands, as well as a book on simple navigation, and even a Pacific Ocean crossing guide, um, and a book about just living aboard a sailing boat. Anyway, it's all at gentlesailing.com. So please do pay the site a visit and browse through my publications if you have a moment. Thanks. Fair winds.